situation so that we can get some sense of normalcy back in the international scene. Uh, as I mentioned to earlier, Sister Davis, her blood pressure was up, she got a little dizzy. And so Susan has taken her to the hospital and is with her at the emergency uh, now. Uh, the Buzz of Spring is a community project of the Beta Delta Sigma chapter of Sigma Gamma Rho so sorority. They are having a pageant on Saturday, March 26th, and it's virtual. Uh, login information uh, will probably be provided later today in the chat box. I believe the Olivers are participating in this activity. Uh, it's one of the things that they do. Uh, it's a service organization and they provide, and it's an honor also, and it, they provide uh, volunteer services to the community. And I believe you are invited to participate virtually. And we may get that information in the chat box for you later today. So congratulations to those that are participating and uh, God's blessings to all of you. On yesterday, John Lockhart was funeralized. Uh, we got a chance to see uh, Linda, and Nikki and Kevin and the rest of the family and friends. Uh, let's continue to keep them and others in prayer who have lost loved ones recently as they continue to grieve the loss of one that they love uh, dearly. Uh, Wesley Leonard provided a video. He was out of the country, but he provided a video presentation for the funeral services. And in it, Wesley uh, disclosed that John Lockhart was one of the persons responsible for teaching him the gospel and bringing the Leonard family into God's family. And so we want to uh, continue to remember the Lockhart family. I know many of you know that John was instrumental in uh, teaching Bible classes along with other uh, brothers in our congregation. Even before we came back here, I, I remember back then uh, with, with uh, Archie and John and the Crutchfields, uh, Greg Hall, uh, just uh, uh, quite a few men in our congregation, uh, you know, and of course, uh, 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 all of the others that helped us to grow our congregation. Let's keep them in prayer. Uh, Kevin said that they'd be returning home on today. Those are all the announcements I have, I believe, for now. Uh, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we're thankful for your presence with us this day on this great, bright, sunshiny spring day, the beginning of spring, uh, where the days are equal, the days and nights are virtually equal, starting at 11.33 a.m. today, Eastern Daylight Time. And Father, we pray your blessings upon us as we enjoy the flowers blooming, the birds singing, and Father, just great weather. And Father, we recognize that there's a pandemic still. Help us to exercise caution. We recognize that there's a world conflict, Father. We pray for the leaders of our nations. And Father, we pray for world peace. And Father, we know that only through our belief in you that there can ever be true peace in our lives and in the world. Father, and we pray your blessings upon us as we worship you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. This morning, scriptural uh, psalms for this morning will be taken from the 135th division of psalms. Again, psalms reading will be taken from the 135th division, verses 1 through 6. And it reads, praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, O servants of the Lord. You who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house 
of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is lovely. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his own possession. For I know that the Lord is great and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all, all the de in all deeps. I've just read to you Psalms chapter 135 of the 135th division, verses one through six. May the Lord add a blessing to the believers, hearers, and doers of his holy and divine word. Amen. Amen. I don't see the songs, but I'm ready um, with my own picks. Um, if it doesn't come forth uh, in front of me, I'll go ahead and sing. We'll sing together. Uh, <clears throat> he has made me glad. <clears throat> If the, if the words to the songs uh, come up in just a moment, we'll go ahead and change that. But right now, let's sing, He Has Made Me Glad. <clears throat> Let us sing. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. Oh, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Amen. <clears throat> yes, Eddie, if we do have PowerPoint, please go ahead and put that forth on the screen. You know, the church um, always need to get right, but looks like we have a home of the soul in front of us. A wonderful story of love. Wonderful story of love. Let's all sing together. Um, and, and we got another change. <laughs> uh, all right. Home of the soul. Home of the soul. Let's sing. If for the price we have striven after our labors are o'er, rest to our souls will be given on the eternal shore. Home of the soul, beautiful home, there we shall rest, never to roam, free from all care, happy and bright. Jesus is there, he is the light off in the storm. Lonely are we, sighing for home, longing for thee. Beautiful home of a ransom beside the crystal sea. Yes, a sweet rest is remaining. For the true children of God, where there will be no complaining, never a chastening rod. Home of the soul, beautiful home, there we shall rest, never to roam, free from all care, happy and bright. Jesus is there. He is the light off in the storm. Lonely are we, sighing for home, longing for thee. 
Beautiful home of the ransom beside the crystal sea. And soon the bright homeland adorning, we shall behold the glad dawn. Lean on the Lord till the morning, trust till the night is gone. Home of the soul, beautiful home, there we shall rest, never to roam, free from all care, happy and bright, Jesus is there. He is the light off in the storm. Lonely are we, sighing for home, longing for thee. Beautiful home of the ransom beside the crystal sea. Beautiful home of the ransom beside the crystal sea. Amen. The song before our prayer will be Wonderful Story of Love. Let us sing together. Wonderful story of love. Tell it to me again. Wonderful story of love. Wake the immortal strain. Angels with rapture announce it. Shepherds with wonder receive it. Sinner, oh, won't you believe it? Oh, wonderful story of love. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful story of love, wonderful story of love, wonderful story of love, though you are far away. Wonderful story of love, still he doth call today, oh, calling from Calvary's mountain, down from the crystal bright fountain, in from the dawn of creation, wonderful story of love. Wonderful, sing it again now, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful story of love, wonderful story of love, Jesus provides a rest. Wonderful story of love for all the pure and blessed. Oh, rest in those mansions above us with those who've gone on before us, singing the rapturous chorus. Wonderful story of love. Sing it again now, wonderful. Sing it again now, wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful story of love. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Scripture reading for this morning is taken from Nehemiah chapter 1, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 11. Again, Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. The word of Nehemiah, the son of Hegel, it came to pass in the month of Chris Lu, in the twelfth year, as I was at Shishan, the palace. 
that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came. He had he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, the remnants that are left of the captivity there and the providence of the great affliction and re, uh, the wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and the gates thereof is, are burnt with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and moaned certain days and fast and prayed before the God of heaven and said, I beseech ye, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servant, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee both, I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept thy commandment, nor thy statutes, nor the judgment which thy commandment, thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee that the words that thou hast commanded thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you, you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn to me and keep my commandments and do, and do them, though there were you cast out into the uttermost parts of heaven, Yet will I gather them from thee, and will bring them unto the palace that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are they servants, thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong might. O Lord, I beseech thee, let not thine ear be, att be attended to the prayers of thy servant to the prayers of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, my servant, this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was king coffee bearer. May God have a blessing to the reading of this word. I just read Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Amen. Good morning, church. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Your wise and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, a day that wasn't promised to us, the opportunity to see a new week and to have new challenges and opportunities to bring glory and honor to your name. We thank you for allowing us to come to a new season. We thank you for the weather that you have been so uh, bountiful towards us by giving us good weather. Lord, we ask for a special blessing. Uh, for our worship service on this morning, that it will be spirit-filled and it will be spiritually uh, spiritually aligned with your will. Help us to sing with uplifted voices, singing and making melody in our hearts. Help us to petition your throne. We realize that it is a privilege to have the vehicle of prayer. And so we thank you. Uh, help us to have one mind and come together in a spirit of unity when we're making our request known to you. You're so good to us, and we thank you, and we love you, and your darling son, who died on behalf of this world to give us the opportunity to make heaven our home. Lord, as we receive the engrafted word that is able to save our souls, we ask that you will bless your manservant, Brother Etienne, uh, to recall the things that he has studied and to impart them to us in a powerful yet simplistic way so that everyone will be able to glean or ascertain the lesson that they will Add it to their Christian lives and be stronger Christians as a result. Lord, we ask for a special blessing as we purpose in our heart what we want to give back to you. You've been so bountiful towards us. Help us to give cheerfully because we realize that you love a cheerful giver. 
Help us to keep our minds fixed on Calvary's cross when we come to the portion that is set aside for commemoration of your son's death, burial, and resurrection in the communion. Lord, we ask that uh, you will bless all the families that are represented on the sound of my voice. You will bless the membership, the leadership, the, the wives, the husbands, the children, the aunts, uncles, grandparents, grandchildren, everyone that is represented under the sound of my voice. We're mindful of our minister who is traveling uh, with his wife, help him to have a safe and enjoyable trip, be able to come back to us and find his home as he left it. Lord, we ask for a special blessing for those who are sick. We are still mindful of the pandemic. It continues to, to rage in some places, but it's going down in other places. You're too wise to make a mistake. And so we just lean on your everlasting arms and just hope, trust, and pray that you will give that measure of strength to those who are in the medical field, who are on the front line, who are in the essential positions, help them to continue to be strong, continue to minister to their fellow man. We just uh, realized that we will understand it better by and by. So Lord, as we uh, grapple with things that are going on with Russia and the Ukraine, the Americans uh, involvement in that process and how it's impacting us on a global standpoint. We just hope, trust and pray that your will will be done and that it will come to a, a quick and, uh, and uh, an appropriate uh, conclusion. We ask that for minimal loss of life, it would be your will. We ask that you will bless all the troops that are involved in that process. Lord, we just ask that you will just bless our, uh, that bless our um, caretakers that are helping our brothers and sisters that are struggling and convalescing. Lord, we ask for a special blessing for those who are bereaved. We realize that you know how to satisfy our needs better than we know how to articulate them, but you have told us to make our requests known to you. And so we're doing that. Lord, as we go through the further parts of the service, we hope just to pray that everything we do and say will be to your glory and to your honor. These things we pray in your darling son, Jesus' name. Let every heart say, amen. 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 Brother Eddie, can I share my screen now? Yes, sir. Uh, this will be the last song Brother Goldson will sing, and he'll be introducing you. So you can, uh, you can indeed, after he sings that song, okay, uh, fantastic. go ahead and share your screen. Brother Ken. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. Amen. Let's all sing together. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not a one. No, not a one. None else could heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. And no friend like him is so high and holy. No, not one, no, not one. And yet no friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one, no, not one. Oh, Jesus knows all about our struggles, and he will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. And there's not an hour that he is not near us. No, not one, no, not one. 
And no night so dark but his love can cheer us. No, not one, no, not one. Oh, Jesus knows all about our struggles, and he will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Brother Eisenhower Etienne. Thank you. I am thrilled to bring you the message from God's word this morning. As a little preliminary remark, whenever you missed me over the past hmm, few months, I've been trying to help the brothers in Montreal and also in Toronto. And I know I can speak for them this morning to say that they send you their greetings. Today we will get a lesson from the account of the building of the walls of Jerusalem, rebuilding by Nehemiah. Nehemiah undertook to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem after a rather long siege. And we'll try to pull out from that the key lessons for us today. Nebuchadnezzar, in about 589 to 587 BC, had led siege to Jerusalem. It was a 30-month siege. 10,000 Jews were taken to Babylon or exiled throughout the empire. Nebuchadnezzar thought he had not finished the job. So he sent his famous general, Nebuzaradan, to finish the task. The brutal general that he was, he dismantled the entire wall stone by stone. Because he knows, as a military strategist, that the wall of Jerusalem would give some defense against its enemies. Nehemiah was one of those who was exiled to Babylon and he was cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. And uh, the beginning of the account unfolds as Nehemiah receives a report from his brothers who had been to Jerusalem and had seen the state of the Jewish nation. When they told him the account, as we read in our the scripture this morning, ne Nehemiah was so taken aback, he was so impacted by it, the dire straits that God's people were in, the Bible says he sat down and wept. I imagine he sat down because his legs lost their strength. And then he mourned and fasted and prayed and confessed. I want you to note very carefully what Nehemiah is doing in response to such bad news. He sat down and he wept. Now for the men among us, I know <laughs> we might say, well, Strong men don't weep. And a lot of us men, we are killing ourselves by bottling things inside 
and uh, going around displaying macho and saying, strong men don't weep. Well, if you could be stronger than our Lord Christ, be my guest. Because he too, when he was, when he was going to resurrect Lazarus from the dead, the Bible says Jesus wept. Nehemiah wept, he mourned, he fasted, he prayed, and he confessed. And the next thing he is doing is quoting the scripture. What God had promised to do with the people if they disobeyed him. And he acknowledged God's love and his promises. He prayed for success. All these actions are driven by faith. Nehemiah realized how big the task is, how overwhelming the task is, that he has purposed in his heart to go back and build the walls of Jerusalem. And he is going to do it by faith. So what we see is faith in Nehemiah. Faith is driving his vision for Jerusalem. Faith is driving his mission. Faith is driving his passion and his dedication to go back and build the walls, all driven by faith. Nehemiah displays a whole lot of courage. In Nehemiah 2, 1 to 5, he had to muster the courage to go and ask the king. Ask the king for permission to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He was cupbearer to the king. And he had never been sad in the presence of the king. So when the king one day, he made up his mind to ask the king for a leave of absence to go and build the wall. He was sad and the king noted that he was sad. And the king says, well, you have never been sad. What is the matter? And then Nehemiah explained to him, I cannot be happy when my people are in dire circumstances. He's asking the king for a really, really special favor. The king said, all right, you go. But then he realized that he cannot just go to Jerusalem because he'd be passing through very unfriendly, unfriendly territory. So he asked for letters for safe path passage. And then he adds another request. Can you tell your governor to allow me to get timber to rebuild the wall? What gives Nehemiah the wherewithal to summon such courage? Well, I want to submit to you that the summoning of such courage can only come from deep faith that God will be with him in executing a go godly mission. You want to know that. And if you notice in Nehemiah 2, 1 to 5, every time Nehemiah is about to make a big decision, he prays. He prays every single time always praying before any action, asking God to show favor to him. But Nehemiah arrives in Jerusalem and the first thing he does, he go, goes to survey the work to be done at night. The Bible tells us he works day and night. He has decided how big the task is, and he must convince the people to embark on such a mighty project. But the people work tirelessly. The people work day and night. What this, this tells you is, a lot of us, we say we have faith in God, we pray and we
we lay back and say, well, let me wait for God to make things happen for me. It does not work like that. Faith in God does not mean that you sit and do nothing. On the contrary, faith in God drives passion to do his work. Faith in God means you work hard. To the point of exhaustion. We see that in the case of Paul. 2 Corinthians 23 to 29. I will let you read it on your own time. Where Paul worked tirelessly. Day and night. Shipwrecked. In the deep. Among robbers. Fleeing from enemies. Because what is driving him to work so hard? Because he knows that what he's doing is a really important task for God. And that's why he could write later, we should redeem the time because the days are evil. Faith drives hard work. I've never seen someone weak in faith work hard for the Lord. I've never seen it. This may sound to you to be an anomaly. If God can just whoosh, make things right, why do we are we required to work so hard? Well, guess what? We are required to work so hard because our commitment to work hard is demonstration that we really love God and we have faith in him. So the lesson for us from Nehemiah is that faith drives hard work. It always does. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10. Oh, I like to quote that for my students, even graduate students, because you know, students these days, um, well, they don't have that penchant for hard work. I, all my, my undergrad students all the time. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. All your might. It's in the Bible. Because in the grave where you're going, there's neither sowing, nor reaping, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. Work at it with diligence, with aplomb, with fervor, with passion. I can guarantee you that you can infer a lot about a man's faith in God by how much he works hard to execute the mission that he has determined that God has entrusted him with. Faith drives hard work. So at the very outset, we are seeing Nehemiah goes back to the word. He brings the people back to the word. Always. Effective faith driven leadership. Always takes people back to the word. Before you can lead God's people. The key lesson is you must be grounded in his word. Amen. Because. The will of God, what is within the bounds of his will, are documented in his word. You cannot will anything. You cannot desire anything in the name of God if it, not, if it is not circumscribed by the will of God as found in his word. So we see that. That passion for executing a great project for God, go back to the word and bring people back to the word. Okay, so Nehemiah has completed the task of building the temple. I will give you the dimensions a little bit later on. He finished the temple in 50, the temple of the, the wall, in 52 days. 
wait and see a little bit later on how much of a project that was that Nehemiah executed in 52 days. Assuredly, you know that God was facilitating the project. What Nehemiah did in 52 days, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I do not think any man can achieve it without great intervention from the hand of God. No sooner he has to go back to his job to Babylon to be the cupbearer for the king. He finds out that the people are backsliding, backsliding into sin, black, backslide, backsliding into lukewarmness, backsliding into mixing with the foreign, um, foreign gods in the land. Backsliding, you must remember, is nothing but straying from the word. That's what backsliding is. So the need for leadership to ensure that whom they are leading are grounded in the word is key. So the key lesson, first key lesson for us from this, in the abs absence of effective faith-driven leadership, most people will backslide. Let me repeat this. If there is not sustained faith-driven leadership, most people, people who think they are children of God will backslide. And I want to go back to this point. Backsliding is going away from the word, not living according to the word. Then from that, we get the key, second key lesson. The second key lesson. One of the most critical functions of faith-driven leadership is to feed the word to God's people. Amen. We cannot overemphasize this. One of the most critical functions of faith-driven leadership is to feed God's word to God's people. Acts 20, 28. Take heed unto yourself, Paul tells the Ephesian elders. Take heed in, 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 from Miletus. Take heed unto yourselves and to the whole, the church over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. Look at this. The culmination point of the charge that Paul is giving to the Ephesian elders is to feed the church of God. What is feeding the word? The, 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 the church. Feeding the church is most importantly making sure that they are in line with the word of God and encourage them to remain faithful to that word. One of the most critical functions of faith-driven leadership. Then, in this account, we see manifest Satan's work. Whenever we are trying to do something great for God, not even great, it doesn't even have to be great. Satan sends enemies. I will let, let you read the account in Nehemiah 2:19 to 20, and Nehemiah 4, 12 to 23, where there were doubters, there were mockers among the foreign, the, the non-Jewish people. Mocking them that they think that they can do, they can rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Accusing them of trying to plot um, a coup, so to speak, against the king. Not knowing that the king had given Nehemiah the leave to go and build the, the, the walls. There are always outside enemies. 
And you must recognize, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, that these outside enemies, they are nothing but angels of Satan who come to distract us, to discourage us, who come to sap our energy from doing what we ex executing our mission for God. But how do you deal with them? You must let faith help you set your hearts on things above, not on earthly kings, things. So when you are being attacked, when you're being attacked because we're doing God's work, what we have to remember we are not working here for ourselves or for personal aggrandizement. We are not working for things that perish. We are working for godly things. And so we must deal with the enemies from without with weapons of righteousness as per 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 3 to 10. And we must always remind ourselves, there will always be enemies of God. There, 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 have never, there has never been a shortage of enemies of God to perturb God's people. Never. They'll never happen. But what we have to remind us ourselves, as the Apostle John said in 1 John 4, 4, don't be disturbed by these people because he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. And that's exactly the posture that Nehemiah took. Oh Lord will give us success. Faith is driving the response to deal with the enemies on the outside. But the worst brothers and sisters are the enemies from within. Despite our best efforts, there will always be enemies within. Satan is a master strategist who knows how to sow place agents within the family of God to attack it from inside. When a family, when a, um, an organization, when a nation is attacked from the inside, that is very difficult to deal with. They masquerade as members of the family. And what they're doing is not advancing the mission, the cause of Christ, but what they're doing, naysayers. When, when Moses was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land, do you see them from time to time, all the time, enemies rising from within. They sow division. They lead others astray. And the, um, if we are careful, those on the inside, we, we, we might give them credence because after all, they claim to be members of the church. They claim to be a family. They are very tough to deal with. And we can only deal with them with love through the word. Go back to Acts 20, verse 28. And 29, he says, for after I have gone, the apostle Paul says, heed your schools will come not sparing the flock. And he said, even from within your own number shall arise men who shall take people, lead people away to follow them. The apostle Paul said, and by the way, it, not, it did not take time after he delivered that message for that to happen. But faith, driven, passion, faith, driven, leadership, faith, driven, mission and vision helps us to resist even the enemies from within. Because we know we are fighting a battle for the work of God. Obviously, Faith-driven leadership must have faith. That is elementary, my dear brothers and sisters. The least thing you would expect from faith-driven leadership is that it must have faith. I used to tell my, I tell my students all the time, you know, when, 
we are discussing case studies, you'd have a, a, a place like McDonald's or whatever other um, fast food um, that, that claims to be serving coffee. And I tell them one of the, the, if you are going to be serving coffee and you're a fast food outlet, the least you can have is good coffee. The least thing you can have. What you see in Nehemiah is faith driving great vision, great planning. You see faith driving dogged determination to complete a challenging task. You see faith driving passion. But equally, you see faith driving great execution. Look at Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 4 and 6. Chapter 4, verses 7 to 9. And you will see that Nehemiah, you can see at every turn of the execution, Nehemiah is praying, praying, praying. Look at verses 7 to 9. Nehemiah chapter 4. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem wall had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed. They were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stop trouble for us, for it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat and threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there's no so much rubble that we can't rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. But then you see, what is Nehemiah's response? Pray, 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 pray. Look at, look, look at, look at verse 21. So we continued the work. Despite these attacks, with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve as guards by night and as workers by day. Neither I, nor my brothers, nor my men, nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon, even when he um, went for water. Pray, 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 and be on the guard. Execution. Successfully completing a project requires great execution. So faith-driven, effective leadership executes. Two things I tell my students all the time. There is not a single semester. I don't make sure that every class gets these two essentials of strategy. I tell them, number one, great strategy is great execution. You can declare a strategy to be great only after it has been successfully executed. No matter how great, quotes, it was, if it fails, you don't execute. It is not a great strategy. The second lesson I tell, 98% of strategic failures are due to poor execution. I see it. I repeat it. 98% of strategic failures are due to poor execution. What do we see in Nehemiah build, rebuilding the wall? In Nehemiah, we see faith driving great execution, unconditionally, executing night and day. So execution, great, um, great faith-driven leadership shows up as some key points. Number one, when faith-driven leadership is undaunted by the magnitude of the task. Undaunted. And it is imbued with passion to complete the task. Finish what you have started. Don't give up until you complete it. They are unperturbed by Marcus' daughters. Faith-driven leadership is unperturbed by mockers and doubters. 
Faith driven leadership has a single minded focus on God's word. Everyone giving their very best, their utmost. Faith driven leadership infects followers from top to bottom. Look at it in Nehemiah. Nehemiah has faith and he's driven, but he has communicated that kind of commitment to the children of Israel. So they too are passionate about the project from top to bottom. So therefore, faith-driven leadership was converted by Nehemiah into faith-driving followership. I must make a point on this. We have a propensity in the churches when projects fail, we blame the leadership. It is clear when a project fails, the leadership has to take some responsibility. But it is not only the leadership. We have to look at ourselves and see, well, did we display the great followership that made the task a little bit easier for the leaders? We have, as followers, we have a role to play. No man can do it alone. No elder or two or three or four or five can do the job of taking the gospel to a lost world alone. Great leaders are always supported, helped by great followers all the time in every single case. Now let us focus on what was accomplished. Je um, um, Nehemiah building the wall. The wall was 2.5 miles long. Can you imagine that? By 39.37 feet high. By eight feet wide. And that stone wall was completed in fifth days. Now, um, you might think, well, let's give a hero's um, plaque, a hero's title to Nehemiah. But Nehemiah reminds us all the time that it is the hand of God that amplified the efforts of the leadership and the people to complete the wall in 52 days building after the siege. What does that mean today? Again, we see Nehemiah takes the people back to the world after the task was completed. Nehemiah 9 verse 1 to 5. On the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. Those of Israeli, Israel descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. They stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law, the Lord, the God, for a quarter of a day and spent another quarter in confession and in worshiping the God. So even after they had confessed at the beginning, repented at the beginning, at the end, when the task is completed, they are going back to confession, by going back to repentance, and above all, going back to being grounded in the word so as not to stray from it another time. This is, we have our Nehemiah moment. We have our Nehemiah, right now, the churches all over the world have the Nehemiah moment to emerge from rubble of the siege and rebuild. What is the siege? Well, we have been on the siege by this virus for better of two years. It was a siege. It was a siege that was almost as long as the siege experienced by the people of Israel by Nebuchadnezzar. 
So our building, we have to rebuild, brothers and sisters. That's the message over here today. There is a need to rebuild because during this pandemic, faith has been frozen. Some lost or discouraged. Some fell away. Some did not maintain link commitment or a strong link with the family. They started to entertain all kinds of doctrines, foreign doctrines. So we need to rebuild the church family. As we emerge from this siege. And it is the role of leadership to provide the faith driving leadership <laughs> that will enable the church to emerge from the siege and become a strong church once again. Amen. But brothers and sisters, we must all execute our part. I implore you. There is no one who doesn't have a part to execute. Your part may be just encouraging. Your part may be giving an example of faithfulness. I'm amazed. I must bring you my mother-in-law, who was, I think, four or five years bedridden. And every time I visit her in Trinidad and Tobago, my wife was taking care of her. She always told me, I'm going to walk one day. But even as she's bedridden, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, she was being a source of encouragement, if you can imagine it. Young people are coming to visit her. And they were being, they were being, they were marveling at the fact that despite the fact that she is on a bed, bedridden for four or five years, she never lost hope. She never lost confidence. And she never stopped encouraging the young and those who came to see her. We must, show, the leadership must show faith driven leadership. But every one of us must also show, must also show faith driven followership to follow Amen. the leaders and to do our very best to do our part as they chart the course as we emerge from this siege that we have been under. It is a siege. I've seen, I'm seeing it devastating churches all over the Caribbean, in Canada. So let us rise to the occasion. We can rise to the occasion. We are the remnants that remain. We who are here today and still coming to church on a regular basis, still say, staying in church, in touch, still doing our best. We are like the remnant of the Jews. We are the remnant. And so we must rise to the occasion and rebuild. How do we do that? Well, Nehemiah fasted. He prayed. He confessed. He repented. He went into action with passion, with determination, with assiduity, with courage. Hey, the word discouragement, the word um, lackadaisical passiveness should not exist in the Christian vernacular. It should not. If you are called to lead on songs, lead them with passion. Um, I can't help mentioning the ladies every week. My wife is attending Bible classes with these senior ladies. And I can't help hearing this class. I am in the house. She's in a room, but I, I pick up little bits and pieces. And I can see how these ladies, week after week, are showing passion, commitment to studying the word and spreading the gospel and doing benevolence, brothers and sisters. So as we prepare to rebuild, let us prepare our hearts for the occasion. Don't just jump in like a blind man into the water. As a boy scout, they would tell us, never, never dive, dive in murky waters. Now is the time to prepare to rebuild 
as we emerge from the siege. Let us adopt Nehemiah's example. Let us pray, pray, pray. Let us confess, confess, confess. We have done wrong, surely. Let us repent, repent, repent. And above all, let us commit in the name of God to bring this family of God right here to build it better, stronger, more resilient. Let us get into action. Let us get into action. I am ready. I trust you are. May the God bless you. May the Lord bless you. Amen. Wonderful lesson. Wonderful. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Our song. Uh, Brother King, can you give us a song of it? invitation? Our song, of, our song of invitation will be Get Right Church. Mm -hmm. Let us sing. Get right, church, and let's go home. Get right, church, and let's go home. Get right, church. Get right, church. Get right, church, and let's go home. I'm going home on the morning train. I'm going home on the morning train. I'm going home. I'm going home. I'm going home on the morning train. So let us get right church and let's go home get right church and let's go home get right church oh get right church get right church and let's go home I want to thank Brother Arlington Howard, Brother Etienne, and um, those that message, a challenging message for us, a faith-driven leadership and faith-driven execution is going to require all of us and our involvement, especially as we are preparing to return to in-person uh, worship. There's so much that uh, needs to be done, and I pray that the Word of God through Brother Etienne's uh, message will inspire all of us to prepare and to be committed to doing our part uh, to make it effective. The church is under siege. The church is being challenged. In this virtual environment, the pandemic has placed us in a position now that we have to rekindle our energy to refocus our efforts uh, to be effective. And just as uh, President Biden has stated, let's build back better, build back better. And that's going to require a strategic plan. And we are thankful to Brother Etienne for uh, motivating us, inspiring us to uh, set forth a plan for this congregation that we can, when we go back, we can go back in a better position to be of service to the Lord and to the community and to each other. Uh, thank you, Brother Etienne. We have several that have made special requests for prayer. And I'll check the chat box first. Uh, Sister Murphy. Sister Murphy is asking for prayer. Olivia is asking for prayer. I said, please pray for myself and my sorority sisters traveling this weekend, this week and weekend. I also pray for my friend Melissa Wood, who is in the hospital and recovering. Uh, Sister Murphy is asking for prayer for traveling for her sorority, and from uh, her friend, Melissa Woods. We're also asking for prayer. Uh, Sylvia Beecham is asking for prayer for the family of Sister Dot Adams at Meridian Woods in the passing of Sister Adams' son. 
Uh, he was funeralized on yesterday. So Solani Davis uh, went to the hospital, blood pressure was up and Susan is with her. Uh, let's keep Sister Davis in prayer. Uh, Imogene Sanders is recovering from a medical procedure. Please uh, put Imogene on your prayer list. The Mackies are requesting prayer for traveling grace. And uh, again, Brother Etienne, thanks for the inspirational message and strategic challenges uh, to build back better. Uh, it requires faith-driven leadership and faith-driven execution, and that involves all of us. Uh, let me just check and see if I have other requests. I don't see any additional requests in the in the box. Uh, shall we pray? Well, Father, on this spring day. Uh, across the world, Father, as we look to this time of year, Father, for a type of renewal, uh, a time to return to outside as things begin to grow, as there are different challenges, Father. Uh, we are inspired by spring, and Father, we pray your blessings upon our congregation as we prepare to return in person, Father, help us to develop a strategic plan for being even more effective as a congregation in spreading the gospel of Christ and being of service uh, to one another. Father, we pray for the Adams family and the loss of their son, Father, and those that loved him as they grieve, Father, we pray and we grieve with them. And Father, for Sister Davis, we pray that her blood pressure will come under control and that she'll be returned to her normal activities and for Imogene, as she continues to recover, Father, uh, be with her, heal her body. And Father, we're just thankful for our congregation. We pray for the Lockhart family, Father, as they grieve the loss of their loved one. And our dear brother, John Lockhart, Father, we pray that you be, them, be with them and keep them safe as they travel back to their destinations. And for Linda and family and relatives, Father, uh, continue to be with them as they mourn the loss of John. And Father, we pray that you will watch over us and our nation, Father, and just as the nations are under siege, Father, by a military conflict, Father, by misinformation, Father, we pray that other nations and friends and allies will come to the support of the Ukraine, Father, that we might, that they might be able to stop this madman who is wreaking havoc uh, throughout uh, the world. Uh, because of uh, being a bully. Father, we pray that in some way, uh, peace may uh, prevail and common sense may prevail. Father, hear our pleas, answer our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Continuing on with our worship service, we come to another part of our worship service known as communion or the Lord's Supper. This is the portion of our worship service where we commemorate our Lord and Savior's death, his burial, and his resurrection by partaking of the Lord's Supper. For scripture reference pertaining to when we are commanded to partake of this act of worship service, I'll be reading Acts chapter 20, beginning at verse 7. And it reads, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow and continue his speech until midnight. In 1 Corinthians, the chapter is 11, beginning at verse 23, the apostle Paul give us the manner, the attitude that we are to have while partaking of the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 23, it reads, for I received, from the Lord, that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us have a word of prayer for the bread. Most wise and heavenly father, we approach thy throne of grace and mercy with bowed heads and humble hearts. 
thanking you for being our God, thanking you for sending your darling son, Jesus Christ, to die on Calvary's cruel cross, thanking you for loving this world so much that you gave your only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him, the power of the gospel and be obedient until death, will have an opportunity to make heaven our home. Father, it's at this time that we ask that you bless this bread that is a symbolic representation of your darling son's broken body. Be with each and every one of us. Help us to commemorate your Lord, our Lord and Savior, your darling sons, by partaking of this bread in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. For it is in your son Jesus' name that we pray and ask these things. Let every heart say amen. You may now partake of the bread. Amen. Continue reading 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But, let a, but a man must examine himself, and in doing so, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. Let us have a word of prayer for the cup. It is again, most wise and heavenly Father, that we approach thy throne of grace and mercy with bowed heads and humble hearts, again, thanking you for being our God, praying to you that everything that we've done up until this point has been pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. Father, it's at this time that we ask that you bless this cup that is a symbolic representation of your son's shed blood. Father, continue to be with us and help us to partake of this cup in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. For it's in your son Jesus' name that we pray and ask these things. Let every heart say amen. Amen. You may now partake of the cup. Let us break bread together on our knees on our knees let us break bread together on our knees on our knees when i kneel down in prayer with my face to the rising sun, O oh Lord, have mercy on me. Continuing on with our worship service, we come to another part of worship service known as giving or collection. This is the portion of our worship service with thanksgiving in our heart. We give back to the one who first gave to us as we have prospered. In 1 Corinthians, the chapter is 16. I'll be reading verse one and two. We, are, we see that the apostle Paul gave instructions to the church of Corinth Reading, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the church of Galatia, so do you also, on the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collection be made when I come. In 2 Corinthians, the chapter is 9, 
beginning at verse six, the apostle Paul provides some additional instructions on the manner or the attitude or the mindset that we are to have when giving up our means back to our heavenly father. Second Corinthians chapter nine, begin at verse six, it reads, now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purpose in his heart, not grudgingly, or under compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiencies in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Finally, Proverbs chapter three, Proverbs chapter three, and I'll be reading verse nine and 10. And it reads, Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Brothers and sisters, there is much to be thankful for. Not on our own accord, but we were allowed to wake up to this beautiful spring day, the first day of this week and, and worship our Lord and our heavenly father in spirit and in truth. We were allowed to see a day never seen before and praise God's name and hear the word from our manservant about being encouraged and, and, and reestablishing and building the church back bigger and better. God is able to bless us beyond our, our imaginations. And I think as we reflect over this pandemic, we can all see that despite all of the trials and tribulation, we are still here and God has been blessing us and keeping us and allowing us to be an encouragement to others. So let us reflect and remember those things as we give back to our heavenly father in a truthful manner. Let us pray. The God of all creation, the heaven and earth, we're just so thankful to you for being our all in all. We're so thankful to you for sustaining us from yesterday to today and for all of the faithful promises that you made to your people. Father, it's at this time that we ask that you be with each and every one of us and help us to be the cheerful givers that's read about in 2 Corinthians. Help us to give back to you, knowing that you are the sustainer of life and any and everything that we need. You will afford all of our sufficiencies to us. Help us to have the mindset and the attitude to be that cheerful giver that's read about. Father, forgive us of our sin and any trespasses that we had against thee or our neighbors or our brothers and sisters. Continue to be with us and watch over us and help us to hold on to your unchanging hand. For it's in your son Jesus' name that we pray and ask these things. Let every heart say amen. Amen.
You muted, Brother Bird. Can't hear you, Clint. Clint, we can't hear you. You're muted. I apologize. I was waiting on a song, and then <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and close out. Uh, we want to thank Eddie and Andrea for their Bible classes this morning. If you if you miss uh, this morning either one, uh, you miss a, a, a treat. Uh, it's a, a great opportunity for us to interact uh, before worship to prepare ourselves for our worship by studying God's word. And we want to thank Brother Etienne for a powerful message on um, not only uh, faithful, uh, faith, faith driven leadership and faith driven implementation, execution. And I said that I'm going to challenge Brother Etienne to present that to uh, the brothers and maybe to the congregation as one of the strategies, developing the strategies for us as we go back to in person worship and as we place emphasis on evangelism uh, going forward. Uh, thank all of you again for uh, the lessons delivered uh, today. Uh, uh, the congregation of Havana has been joining us for Bible class and they uh, have shared their information for us on worship. They meet on, two, on Thursday nights for Bible class and we're gonna give you the link uh, later uh, that you can maybe join them on Thursday nights for some of their Bible class. They're small in number, but they're doing an excellent uh, job. And we pray God's continued blessings uh, upon that congregation. Shall we pray as we uh, dismiss? Father, we thank you for the inspiration. And I guess because of springtime, Father, we can call it in springation. Uh, we are excited about the possibilities and the opportunities. Father, help us now to have the enthusiasm and the zeal in going forward with the implementation uh, through faith. Be with us, Father. Be with Sister Davis, Father. We hope that all is well uh, with her and with others and for the Lockhart families, and others that have lost loved ones. Father, comfort them as only you can. And we pray that we might be a source of encouragement to them and to others. We're thankful for our Bible class teachers and our speaker, Father. We thank you for the words of encouragement, for meditation, and Father, that it might help us as we go forward uh, this week. Uh, we look forward to the springtime, Father, as we are uh, encouraged to, to get out and become more proactive. Be with us now as we depart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.